And now we're getting ready to do our panel. We have nine, we have 12 people from the movie. Actors, cinematographer, artist, tattoo artist. These are legendary characters that you all know and the work that you've seen in the movie uh, for, so many, for so many years. How many first generation, like the first time you saw your movie, this movie was this year? Okay, how many, uh, you saw this movie like five years ago? 10 years ago, when did you discover it? 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Woo! And you still watch it, right? Okay, Taylor, um, if you could take your seat. One, two, three, four, right there. And uh, can we have the actors come on up so that we can start the panel discussion? Locos over here. Freddie. Jenny. Okay, this was a, a real male oriented movie, of course, but we have the mother, Jenny Gago, who played the mother. Thank you for joining us. Um, Gabriel, right here. Okay, are we all here? We're all here. And Adan. And um, Consuelo, okay, good, okay. Uh, really quick, I'm going to go around, everyone's gonna say their name and the character they played or their position or what they did for the film and then we're gonna get started with the questions. Okay, we'll start with? Uh, Freddy Negrete, uh, tattoo artist. Woo! Yeah. Gabriel Beristain, cinematographer. The look, Jesse Borrego, Crucito. Enrique Castillo, Montana. Jenny Gago, Lupe. Mike Genovese, Sergeant Devereaux. <laughs> Jeff Rivas, Carlos. Cocaine is America's cup of coffee, eh? <laughs> Carlos Carrasco, Popeye. Oh, Give me some John John! <laughs> Victor Rivers, Magic Mike. Yeah. One line. Sorry, which one? <laughs> I'll give my life to you, Hefe. Yeah. Yeah. El Gilbert. Hey, Crosito, congratulations. <laughs> I did all the arte. I did all the arte for Crosito. Ray Oriel, Spider. Check out the new view, homies. I'm gonna build myself a righteous pad here. Swimming pool, white, pink, and fancy chin. Consuelo Flores, cultural consultant specializing in the Day of the Dead scene. <laughs> Uh, Raymond Cruz, I play Chewy. Yeah. Oh, those locos forever! Uh, Valente Rodriguez, I played Frankie. Hey, you're right, you're turning brown, Cardan. Taquita brown. Okay, since everyone said a line, Crucito. Oh. My favorite line is, we come out chased by hounds, wearing a bean to your rabbit's foot for love. We got something better than a rabbit's foot. We got familia. Raza. My favorite line in the movie is We should be taking care of each other instead of fighting over street corners. Okay, 
Okay, so let's get started with a wonderful information about the movie. A little tidbits that you can tell all of your uh, friends and family who watches the movie. Taylor, why did you decide to make a movie about vatos locos and prisoners? And what was the genesis of this movie? Well, I think, uh, you know, as I said before, Jimmy Baca said to me, this is a story that needs to be told. You know, when you, when you look at Jimmy Baca's life, running in the streets, uh, getting in, tr in trouble with the law as a young kid, going to jail early, and watching how he turned his life around. And what he said was, these three cousins, they are all related, they all have different stories, and each of them, their life changes. That's a story worth telling, and it's a story about La Raza, it's, a, it's about my culture, and I agreed with it. I mean, as I said, I grew up with my friends who, you know, who were Chicano, and I went into their houses, and their parents would speak Spanish to them, they turned around to speak English. You know, it was a time where there was, you know, th that sense of pride, which I've watched grow. I, I went to South America, I lived in Bolivia, I learned Spanish, and I came back with different eyes about my culture here in Los Angeles, and realized it's really a, a Latino town, you know. And at the time I came back, people didn't know it. So my, my job, it seemed to me, I tell a lot of different stories, but the idea of doing stories that celebrate Chicano culture was something I wanted to do. And with La Bamba, we did it, and with Blood and Blood, we did it. But I did it with Jimmy Baca. And one thing I want to say here, you know, what was important to me was to make this film deep in the blood of what we were, the, the communication, what we're trying to make of the culture. So to find a Don Hernandez in San Antonio, a great American painter, a great American painter, you know, to, to actually, because you can say Cruzito is talented, you gotta see that he's talented. And when Jesse, you know, spent all the time with Adan and learned and painted, but those are Adan's paintings. They're puro Chicano paintings. And they're, you know, this is a Puchuco. He grew up as a Puchuco. But he ended up by making paintings that transcend, like all great art does, to culture. And in, in that instance, that's, you know, that's, that's very important. You know, to get, where's Freddie? To get Freddie Negretti. You know, Freddie Negretti uh, learned his craft of tattooing in San Quentin. He actually was there, understood it. And I wanted him to actually put the, the paintings on bodies that is so important, so important to guys in the Pinta. So casting these actors, which was a long, laborious process, I want to mention Rick Pagano, who is the casting director, you know, and Sharon Bialy, who was also his partner. These two people brought these people to me, and, then, and I can't tell you how many actors we saw, because Jimmy Baca wrote really interesting characters. You know how hard it was to find a Popeye? <laughs> you know, I, I also want to mention, you know, there are, there are two members of the original Vatos Locos who are not here tonight, Ben Bratt and Damien Chapa. And they would, they would have been here. Damien is in Europe working, and Ben is in Atlanta working. And he, he told me if I if I don't if they don't make me work all night on Friday night I can be there. But of course they did. So they send their love to you. They would have been here. Luckily we've got Cruzito and, and the other members of the Vatos Locos here. And and I want to also say Gabriel Berenstein. Gabriel is Mexicano. He came here from Mexico. He has a very political background. I you know when I, I asked him to do this I said I want a look. I want a full, rich look that's going to embody this culture. And he gave it to us in such a beautiful way. So all of these people were cast, but the important thing is they had a passion for this project. Every single one of us believed in the project. We didn't have all the money in the world, but we believed that we were telling an important story. And tonight, it, it does us a huge amount of good and, and pride to know that you feel the same way. So thanks, and I just wanted to, just basically say this was something we thought, and again, it came out of the pen of Jimmy Baca. Thank you, Taylor. Okay, let's, let's hear about, um, who did you cast first? The Vatos? I, I, yes, the first, the first people cast, I gotta tell you, 
the first people cast, uh, you know, it's all, it was always an interesting story. Cruzito was the first person, but you know, Jesse's from San Antonio and he came in, he's a man with a lot of integrity. He went to Cal Arts, he does his things. And I said, hey man, I want you to do it. He looked at me like, you want to make a film about Chicanos? <laughs> and it was like, he was, giving me, he was giving me that eye, you know? But, you know, the important thing was, was to get that working. And he was always Cruz, and he was the first one cast. The second one cast was Ben Bratt. And Ben Bratt, very interesting, he came in and he said, you know, as actors will say to you, he said, hey man, I saw, this spoke to me. Uh, I, gotta, I gotta play this role. It's, it's my life. And I'm thinking, and I'm thinking, uh, cool, it's his life, that's great. He's gonna play Paco. He looks at me and says, no, man, I'm playing Miklo. <laughs> and if you know Ben Brad, he's puro indio, no? Puro indio, a face. His mother is Peruvian. His father is German. So Ben came out, you know, this is what happens in, you know, La Raza. Ben came out, his mother, puro indio. But in his mind, he wanted to play Miklo because he, he identified so man. I said, I'm sorry, but it ain't gonna work that way. Paco's a great role. And then we looked and looked and looked and looked because I made up my mind, there are a lot of white actors, there are a lot of Caucasian actors that can play Miklo because Miklo is, he again, is half and half, but he looks white. And uh, I turned a lot of, and I won't tell you who, but some of the great actors that wanted this role. We looked and looked and looked, and finally Damien, Rick Pagano brought in Damien Chapa. Damien Chapa is the opposite of Ben Brad. His father is Puro Chicano, and his mother was from the Ozarks, and he came out looking like his mother. But it works for Miklo, because that is the story. And as Jesse said, he came out hating his own white skin, because he wanted to be Latino. And the character in, as Miklo, which is a tragic character, is, is that so they, that's the order they were casting. <laughs> then everybody else came in as they came, and it was not easy, believe me. I mean, finding somebody that's going to be able to embody the power and the elegance and the belief of Montana, <laughs> not easy. <laughs> and Kiki came in, and, and it was very interesting to see because when he came in, and he had all these guys, they immediately fell into line behind Montana. He was the mero mero, right? And he, he, he took it. I said, man, I can't do it. You gotta take it and you gotta make him believe in you. And he did. So all that uh, is, was, a, was a joy because when you cast, you can't take the easy way out. You gotta go for it until you find the right people. You know, Ray Oriel, you know, from San Pedro. I mean, you know, can you imagine being in this film without Spider? <laughs> he was amazing. So every one of these people uh, were, I think, inspired. Ginny playing Miklo's mother. You know? The great thing about it is Miklo being a white father, you see a little bit of the beginning of the movie, and a Chicano mother. You know, it all works. And then you as La Raza know the way this works. It's a very complicated community. So anyway, I'm going to shut up and let everybody else talk. But it was a passion that I, you have to understand, when you are not of that, you trust the people around you. Jimmy Baca was there, I gave him a role. I gotta tell you one interesting story. Jimmy, as I said, served eight and a half years in the joint. And he got out and he won the National Book Award. And he appeared everywhere. I said, Jimmy, I need you. I need you to be in this movie. Not as an actor, although I'll give you a role as an actor. I need you next to me because you got the real voice. He says, okay, so we go to San Quentin. When you go into San Quentin, and I, you know, I want to mention other people are here. You know, Tom Tolles, who is unfortunately dead. Uh, uh, Lanny Flaherty, who plays Big Al. How about that character? Big Al is amazing. Uh, and Billy Bob Thornton, who you probably all know, which was one of his first roles ever. Billy Bob Thornton came in wearing 145 pounds. I knew him as a writer, a professional writer. And, and over the course of time, when you go into the joint, you see all these guys, and they're built. They're really built. Billy Bob knew he looked puny. By the end of the shoot, he weighed 205 pounds. He went from 140 to 205. I said, 
you're an actor. <laughs> I know you're an actor because you went in. But the important thing is that everybody had to live this part. When we went into the joint, we took nine Chicanos, two, three blacks, three whites, and then we traveled with 300 cons. Every day they were our extras. That's a scary thing, and you have to sign something when you go in the joint. You say, we don't have a hostage policy here. There's a problem, that's it. And I'll tell you how this worked. When you go to the joint, when you're in a prison, the warden is the, is the dictator. He's the president, he's got all the power. And the warden of San Quentin Prison was a guy named Danny Vasquez. And I went in to meet him in his office, and he was a tough son of a bitch. But I looked at him, and he's sitting across from me, and I look right here, he's got a placa. <laughs> this is a guy who knew what this film was about. He ran, you know, he, had, he, he was in a clique when he was a kid. He turned his life around, he was in law enforcement, he was running it. He, he trusted us, and we were in his world. And as we went in there, all of these guys, when they, they were working, they were working next to guys that were doing life sentences, the whole thing. So when you see this film, and the same thing in Islos, when we had, we had Chavalitos who were working with us, who were the real deal. What we prepped this film, I had Jesse and Ben and Damien go and live in the barrio. They lived there to be able to, I said, listen, man, you're all from a different places. You've got to understand the neighborhood you're from. And they got in some pretty hairy stuff they might tell you about. But the important thing was, as actors, they were committed. The whole movie, that was the thing they were committed. So that's what I was OK, let's start with, with uh, the Vatos Locos. Uh, you guys went in. How did you guys come together? Did you guys hang out together, all your Vato Locos? How did that work out, Jesse? Most, most actors, you know, love to, uh, you know, get into the get into the character and the role. So I think when Taylor suggested that we live there, uh, we were in City Terrace actually, with the Gary Loma boys, who, you know, Big George, part of his family, Raymond, and their family. They were affiliated, even though they weren't. Uh, the, they were working with gang youth services, but they helped us out a lot. Interface with the with the neighborhood. I grew up in Barrio, so it was easy for me to be. But the other actors uh, had a lot of fun uh, getting to know everybody, getting the onda, getting the mannerisms down. Uh, but from what I saw with this stellar cast, I mean, every single one of these guys, whatever role they played, from the first time we did the the table reading, you could see that everybody was bringing their A game. And so it was easy to see that as the, because it was a whole year long process to this thing. They were supposed to be in San Quentin one month. They wound up being there for two and a half months longer than they were supposed to be there. So they were immersed in this, but we love that as actors, as difficult as it is. And so I got to see every single one of these guys technique, their immersion into these characters. But because they were committed, they all wanted to represent the cultura correctly. They all wanted to represent the story in the best way. Like he said, Jimmy Baca's words were Chicano Shakespeare to us. So as actors, we relish that. So I think that the bonding when we were in Gary Loma, when the Vatos Locos all got together and started hanging out and cliqueando and you know, Valente and Raymond, they know the culture, so it was easy for us to, you know, we improved a lot. Taylor really let us get the juices going and improv a lot. And I, from what I saw, it was the same with La Onda and the guys that were, that, that were the clique there. I really saw them as actors. I didn't recognize them. When I saw the film, one of the best things I love about this film is I don't recognize any one of these guys when I'm watching the movie. I just sit there and I'm, I'm, I'm taken away by it. So I think that that was the most important thing that we as actors could really do is just enjoy the ride. Uh, that they were setting up and then the rest of it was beautiful the beautiful the beautiful beautiful photography and camera work uh, the beautiful direction and Everything that was around us all the crew everything all the art You know working with Adan when they went to prison I tell everyone when they went to prison for two months I went back to San Antonio grew out my heroin look and sat in this man's studio for two months 
and watched him paint all those masterpieces. So if you don't tell me that, that the, the, the performance that I did was not informed by hanging out with him for two months and watching him paint these, then you don't know actors. And that's what we live for. We live to be able to breathe something that then becomes that. To the point of where people say, hey, do you still paint? I don't paint. <laughs> These guys have never been to prison. They're not criminals. But you know what? That's what we love as actors. And I think that gift to our raza. Because generationally, we've passed it on like Godfather, like the Godfather to the Italian culture. So thank you. Thank you to, you, to all of you. And uh, let's let some of the other actors talk yeah, about yes, the immersion yes. process. Uh, yeah, we want, we want to have everyone say a little bit of something. So um, the actors, you know, Hollywood says there's no Latino actors. Hollywood and director, Hollywood directors who know Latinos can find those actors. And Taylor and his casting director, they found them and they're here. So some of, for some of the actors, this was maybe one of their first movies. I don't know if that was your, your um, experience, but can you talk about that, Valente and Raymond? Hi, I'm Valente, I play Frankie. Frankie! Um, yeah, um, hey! At the local border! <laughs> uh, that's where I met Raymond. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, it was it was like the third or fourth film I did, and so I really had no idea about anything other than um, oh, wow, somebody's gonna give me money to act. That's badass. And so, um, but I, I'll tell you this funny story. Um, when we first, when uh, Taylor said um, we got the Vato Locos and we're gonna let you guys improv and it was Jesse and myself and Raymond and Benjamin Bratt and Damien wasn't there but Benjamin Bratt was there and Benjamin Bratt is supposed to be playing this badass Vato right and he's wearing penny loafers and he's got a penny <laughs> in the shoe so I went off on him like whoa Vato you got a penny in your shoe Vato What's your gang name, Penny? Yeah, what's your gang name, Penny? And I think that's what got me the job. I was, I, I needed to thank Ben for that because I don't know that I'd gotten the job for that. Uh, I remember we were working and people used to walk up and hand me and Valente weed when we were shooting. But Val said, I said, hey Val, why do people keep handing us weed? And he goes, I don't know, but don't say anything. <laughs> so we got a lot of weed on the movie. Yeah, Val and I became, um, and Jeff Rivas, we all played golf together, we became friends from this movie. So, we, we're, we're, we're Vatos Locos on the golf course, <laughs> and, and we all got pretty good games. Okay, let's talk to um, Spider, can we give it a Okay, he's the bat, he's the other um, faction of the other gang, and so, who were your, your um, guys? Well, your gang, they're not here today, right? Tres puntos. So how was it? Are you really a gangbanger? Oh, there he is. You were tres, tres puntos? puntos? Okay. Magic Mike was tres puntos. <laughs> now, when I met Taylor, I was doing a, a play on Broadway, uh, and uh, he was out there, uh, you know, looking at people for this film. And uh, I actually, uh, I, that, that play ended and, and I got offered to do a, a, another play, but I, I knew he was doing the film out here on the West Coast and I wanted to come out here and do this film. And I came in to read for him and Jimmy Vaca and uh, I read for the role of Paco uh, and, uh, you know, he, I didn't get it, but, but uh, he said, I want you to play this other role, Spider. And I'm like, ah, I, go, I don't really want to do that. He goes, no, no, I think you should do that. He said, you know what? He goes, trust me. He goes, I'm gonna, I go, well, there's a lot of stage direction there. There's not a lot, a lot, a lot of lines. He's like, play ball with me and I'll play ball with you. He says, you, you know, you come out, we're gonna play and I'm gonna let you know, we're gonna improv. We got Jimmy Baca there. And he was a man of his word. I'm telling you, I've done a lot of stuff. I, I'm a longshoreman now. I'm a crane operator down in San Pedro. But this is like my claim to fame. I mean, down there, Spider, it, it's, it's, he was a man of his word. He, I went out there and I had a great time being around all these actors and it, it was just like I said, I thank all the people for uh, all you still letting it live on and stuff like that. It, it really shows, you know, what, what, what we did. Thank you. Okay. 
let's let's quickly go before we go to prison and we're running out of time so we're gonna go a little bit faster before we go to prison let's talk about the opening and the look and how taylor wanted to bring the culture into the film and you can talk a little bit about that uh consuelo what what would, was your part that what you bring so um when i um got the call from Self Help Graphics, who was the originator of the Day of the Dead celebration here in Los Angeles, that uh, there was a, a film company that was looking for some... Uh, for someone to um, come in and, and be a consultant for the Day of the Dead scene that they were doing. Uh, I, I actually was a little suspicious at first to be very honest, because no one really wants to do something um, that is authentic. And I was very, very mistaken, and I was glad to be mistaken, because what they did was let me read the script and all the directions, all of the staging that was in the script with regards to the Day of the Dead scene. And I I was a consultant. I told them what worked and what didn't work. I. I was uh, able to gather all of the artists, all of the makeup artists, all of the look for that show, for that particular um, scene, uh, all of the extras, the dancers, the props, the little, I still actually have two of the Day of the Dead figurines that were highly featured, one in the uh, cemetery where the two little boys are playing with that little uh, um, king. It's a little Day of the Dead uh, paper mache doll that's a king. I have that in my home right now. So it was, it was very, that man who made that, all of the paper mache dolls um, studied with the Linares family in Mexico. So you know that that is authentic. That is an amazing lineage to have for this movie. Thank you. Thank you, but thank you very much. I, I want to say that I thank Taylor for really being committed to the culture. Thank you. And now, when you make a movie, there's got to be a look, and that's all discussed right before the movie. And the man that gives that movie the look is the cinematographer, the director of photographer. Freddie, can you give... Oh, yeah, you got the mic. Tell us, what did Taylor say? What did he want the movie to look like? Hi. Well, Taylor, Taylor is truly an artist. And I have to say that. And one of the very few Hollywood directors who is an artist. He and I, and, and, and we need to mention somebody else, Bruno Rubeo, his production designer. He's up there, he's looking at us, and I know that he's with, here with us. Bruno, Taylor, and I, we have worked in several films together. We have worked in two films with Taylor. And every time, the creative process in pre-production is unique, as unique as this film is. We work together, we find images. Taylor gave me a mandate. I want to feel the heart of the culture. And we follow a dance paintings, I follow it. I travel all about East LA. I try to find and get the colors, the palette of colors of this culture. And, and, and every element that, uh, and thank you very much, that scene, opening scene is fantastic. James Bond copied it, as you know. <laughs> and uh, 20 years or so 30 years later. So anyhow, what these conversations, that, that element of, of, of being completely committed to make a film that was unique in their look was pay off. And I, I believe that we have produced and we made a film that visually, as in the performance, in the script, in the spirit, in the heart, is totally unique. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you, everybody. You were great. Thank you, Gabby. Uh, okay, no, also... No, one, one thing, I, okay. Gabriella, really a, a very great artist and also a very unselfish artist. And I, I, feel, I feel badly because I didn't mention Bruno. Bruno was a production designer. Uh, Bruno was Italian, but he was married to a Mexicana. And, uh, got, and she's a very, very big uh, costume designer now. But Bruno was part of our team. The three of us walked East Los Angeles. We had an office in East Los Angeles. We wanted to make that real. Every moment of that. And of course, uh, when we shot in San Quentin, you see the big things, but you couldn't do any violence in San Quentin. So Bruno was the one who discovered me at the time when I was at the lowest point in my career as a Chicano artist. 
Being a Chicano artist is really hard because nobody recognizes you as a valid artist. And, when, and the next day, Taylor flew down to meet me and talk to me about the film. And I told Taylor, I don't do commercial work. He goes, no, you are gonna do your vision of Crucito's character, whose uh, first work is very carefree and battles in cars, he told him, and then it turns dark. Well, it, it, is, it so happened that my daughter, at 18 months, fell out a second story window and fractured her skull when I was doing these carefree scenes. And then my work, I couldn't sleep at night. My, my work started getting dark and I was painting like all, almost all night. And then Taylor approached me with this uh, project and I told Taylor, what does Agavacho want to do a, a, a movie about Chicano? <laughs> he goes, I grew up with the Valdez brothers, you know, suit suit. I said, oh shit. And then he started talking to me in Spanish. <laughs> and you know, he treated me with such respect during the film, during the creation of all those paintings for the movie. I almost died doing the, the working on those paintings, you know? So I was doing a painting a day because of the schedule. But Taylor said, before signing, he said, are you sure you can do this work? We're talking about 30 original pieces of work. I said, Vato, I used to pick cotton all summer long. I can do this out there. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Okay, we're really quickly going to go into prison because we're running late on starting the movie. But when you get to prison, um, like someone said, these are not prisoners. They, they're not hoods. They're not hoodlums. They have to become. And for that, you, if you're in, the, in prison, you have to have your tattoos. And Freddy Negrete was one of his, for, or was the first movie, right, that had the tattoos for film. So tell us about who you tattooed. Uh, what was the, the concept and how fast you got to do them? Well, uh, the tattoo, tattooing was uh, a lot like the movie. Uh, a lot of problems, big problems with the tattoos. You know, so uh, when Taylor came, he came to me, I was uh, doing a tattoo at a tattoo convention. And he goes, I hear that you're the guy for prison tattoos. And I was like, yeah. And we talked more, I went and we made the agreement. And he tells me, okay, you're going to be working with this makeup artist. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I could do tattoos and I could design tattoos, but doing fake tattoos, I don't know nothing about that, you know. And, uh, you know, actually the makeup artist didn't know nothing about it either. You know, so, and he's relying on him. And the thing is, is that tattoos weren't popular back then. I mean, tattoos are in every film you see now, in every TV program, because tattooing has become very popular. But uh, not back then. And so anyways, uh, when, when I saw that this method he was using wasn't going to work, I, I got really nervous about it. In fact, uh, we had Magic Mike come down to this apartment where we were going to do a test run. And it was a mess. His arm, we left his arms just like green, you know. The, this is not good. We're going to San Quentin in two days. What are we going to do? <clears throat> then when we get up there, so in, in my little mind, I'm like, we need a backup plan here, you know? And uh, so then we got up to San Quentin and we were applying the tattoos. The makeup artist wasn't even there. He was in Folsom working on American Me. And, and, uh, <clears throat> and I was like, I already had this backup plan. I already knew this wasn't gonna work. So when they tried applying the tattoos, again, I'm Magic Mike, it didn't work. And uh, <clears throat> So, and when they found out that the makeup artist was over there in Folsom, I mean, this is trouble. This is big trouble in the production. And uh, <clears throat> so anyways, they had a meeting. I told Taylor, I go, Taylor, I got an idea. I've got refillable markers. We'll fill them up with dark green ink. We'll put stencils on like a tattoo and we'll just draw the tattoos on. All we need is a couple more tattoo artists. And, uh, and we made it work. You know, and we had, it was kind of tough because, you know, uh, it came off in the showers and this and that. But when we got back to LA, Taylor told me, look it, there's a guy that does good tattoos for a movie, Freddie Blau, um, and, uh, and I want you to work with him. I always did whatever Taylor said, he's the boss. <laughs> and uh, and the fr Freddie Blau was like, this, this is no good. He goes, my method is gonna work. And it did work, and I worked with him, and I continue to work with him until he retired for 15 years uh, doing tattoos for movies. 
Ready, blow, yeah. Thank and you. First one, blood in, blood out. But uh, about the tattoos, I, I was glad that, you know, because that, you know, I'm from a barrio. I went to prison. I lived that life, and um, so it was easy to design these tattoos because tattoos for the rasa is about who we are, where we're from, and the things we love. It was easy to design for that. And on that note, let's. One thing, I, this is important because this film has this film has an authenticity, and Freddie's, you know, doing Chicano tattoos. But I went to this convention, and he had a, you know, these are, these are very famous guys within their own community. So Freddie's there, and a guy came up who was a big tattoo artist in San Francisco, and he said, man, I want to pay you with respect. I have one place left on my entire body, and I've saved it for you. And uh, Freddie goes, man, that's cool. He says, what do you want? He says, man, I would never tell an artist what to put. You choose. And your shin bone is one of the most sensitive places you can ever be. And I sat there, and Freddie said, and Freddie said, well, how about if I do the devil, and he's got a cross with a dagger at the end, and, and he's trying to strangle Christ, but Christ stabs him in the heart. <laughs> and the guy says, that's, that's, that's really cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Freddie, right there, just so you know, I sat this close and he tattooed for four and a half hours on this guy who was going, it was like, and it was hot in there, it was sweating and so on. And I said, man, this is the guy. This is clearly it. But the thing you have to understand is that we had these ideas, you know, when you're in the movies, you say, oh, you know, who's going to have a tattoo? Or we'll do this here. You go to the joint and they are totally tattooed. So what we had set up was one, you know, Jeff Rebus was going to have you know, three tattoos. You go there, and as I said, these actors are sitting around with the real deal, real guys that are in the joint. And so we had to, I had to turn to Freddie and say, man, we're gonna multiply these tattoos. We gotta cover these guys. And that's a fact of life. And these are things you don't think about when you see the movie. But when you, and you got no time, you gotta do it. So when you have people, this is the thing about a professional, delivering under pressure. Anybody can take a year to do something. When you don't have time, but you've got to do it, and you've got to do it well, that's what we had. Adan is talking about it. He hadn't done it before. I said, Adan, I need all those paintings. Can you do it? And he sits there and said, he never done that before. He painted, but not 30 paintings. Yeah, I'll do it. And Freddie, you know, I, I did these things, but I do, I'm a, I do individual stuff, man. I spend a whole day on it. Like, no, you got to do all this stuff. And what you do when you're when you're facing it, you either stand there as a professional and deliver. We all did that. All of us had to go do something we'd never done before, and it, and it, that's why we're so close because we we stood there in the middle of battle and it worked. Thank you. Okay, okay now let's go to prison really quick. Um, El Mero Mero, um, you had a tattoo. You had all these guys. You had to control. And you had all the, the, what is it, the white guys who were like, uh, the Aryan brothers, thank you, who were, who were attacking you guys. So how did you keep it all control? And first off, start with your, with your tattoo. What, what did that mean? Uh, we actually spent a, uh, quite a bit of time trying to find the right tattoo for Montana. And we went through hundreds, actually, of tattoos until we finally saw one. We said, wow, that's it. And that was the rosary that ended up with the cross in the middle finger. <laughs> which, which to me was perfect because I'm a great believer in my pre-Columbian culture of duality. Which is something that when he talked about Luis Valdez and Danny and El Teatro Campesino, I was part of El Teatro Campesino. I was a campesino. That's how my family was which I'm sure is part of the culture of a lot of us here. But anyway, I'm a true testament that Taylor Hackford does make mistakes. <laughs> he cast me in the movie, <laughs> and I never was in prison. <laughs> but I grew up on the border, um, and obviously Spanish was my first language. 
and I kept it in defiance of them trying to beat it out of me in school. And in fact, two of the guys that wrote El Libro de Caló, which is about uh, Pachuquismo, were from my hometown. So I know the culture very well like that, from the streets and from being educated. I met Luis actually when I was at the University of California at Berkeley. <laughs> And I used to pick him up in my 56 Chevy to take him to the college. Then I became a member of his company, and it was when I was with his company where I met Helen Mirren, Academy Award winning actress, who was working with Peter Brooks' company at the time. But anyway, I was probably the last person that Taylor saw for Montana, because all the other guys had already been cast. And he told me, the casting director, when I went in to meet him, uh, he told me right off the bat, I don't think you're right for this role. I didn't have a beard and I didn't have any, I was just dressed normal, casual. And I happened to have a portfolio with photographs and then I flipped through it and there was one photograph that caught his eye. And it was a photograph that a very intelligent person told me to take, and that was my wife. <laughs> I had been working out for six months, I had a slingshot t-shirt on, and I had had my trim, beard trimmed, and I had a black sash that I had tied on, and I took the picture, and when he saw it, he said, who is that? And I said, yours truly. So he said, hold on a second, he went back, and he brought Taylor out. And Taylor said, I'm, gonna, I'm sorry to do this to you, but I'm gonna give you six scenes to memorize and I want you to come back tomorrow and we're gonna do a screen test. So I went home and I didn't go to prison to study. <laughs> but I came back and we screen tested with all the guys and then he asked me, I want you to really push Miklo in the scene in the cell. And I said, what does that mean, right? What am I gonna do to Miklo? So I did something rather unexpected for him and when he was complaining, I actually slapped him in the face really hard and everything went dead quiet and afterwards actually Damien said I was I was thinking about killing you but <laughs> but it really helped me out but uh, I will obviously forever be grateful to Taylor's trust in me uh, not only just for casting me but also for telling me you know this better than I do so I'm trusting you to bring more to this character that is on that is on the page. And thankfully, because of my love for my culture and having also had many people in in my family who unfortunately have done time, I never have. And so as a result of that was actually what kind of prepared me to be the bilingual actor that Taylor needed, that understood the culture from not only the Chicano perspective, from the pre-Columbian perspective also, which is part of what Jimmy's uh, interest is also. And Jimmy was my celly, he was El Gato, and we got along great. And I challenged Jimmy a lot during the shooting of the film in terms of his writing also. But uh, that was my experience with the cast. When we went to San Quentin, it was very sobering, yes, to to have to sign your life away and go into the sally port where they close the doors in front of you and behind you and then you hear the chatter of the guys it was very difficult shooting in prison because those guys are actual prisoners and when you're trying to do your dialogue they're screaming obscenities every minute of the day and they're they're not going to stop being themselves because you're a bunch of actors and you say okay Roll cameras, you know, back to what we were saying back to one a lot, right? <laughs> Let's do this again. So it was a very sobering experience, but a very, very um, worthwhile and a life changing experience for all of us, I'm sure, that went in there. Okay, let's talk to your some of your prison gang. Prison gang, okay, you guys were the traitors. Um, what what give us you guys were the traitors what give us uh some insight into your characters and and how it was doing those roles 
just really quickly because we have to start the movie very okay. soon. Uh, well, I, I played Magic Mike and, and I was the warlord of La Onda and uh, I grew up as, as a child in a war zone of violence and so it was the appropriate role for me. And uh, so when I walked around that prison, San Quentin, um, I, I said there before the grace of God because I was headed that way. I was 15 years old, I was 6'2", 200 pounds, a gang member, but I'm the child that the village raised. So my, my community took me in and was able to change my life, but I was able to, to call on that violence and to call on that, that authentic place of anger and not, having, not being able to articulate my pain and, my, and what I was feeling as a child into the role of Magic Mike and and uh, and for for a long time I was loyal to to the beliefs of Montana and but I I, I saw that it was time to maybe take a different path and um, and so I think that that's when we kind of became a little bit of a Judas in the film but uh, it's a film that changed my life it changed my perspective about incarceration I'm a national spokesperson on in violence against women um, and. Um, and um, and I talk about blood and blood out at every uh, at every uh, speaking engagement that I have when I talk to members of Congress, because it's violence is a learned behavior, and we're learning them in our homes and in our and in our relationships, and then we're carrying them out into our streets. So if we can stop violence against women, uh, we'll go a long way on ending all kinds of violence. I have two major takeaways from this experience of being in this film, and as you've heard, there are so many anecdotes and so many stories that we could be here all night sharing, but I just want to say two things about it. One is, and they both have to do with gratitude, I am extremely grateful to the community of this film, and by extension to your community, for having embraced me, because when I was first cast in this movie, I kind of thought it was a mistake because I am from Panama, and uh, I, spent a, I spent a lot of my early time in the States, in New York. So when I had only been in, in Los Angeles for uh, about a year when the uh, opportunity to audition for this came up, and I was a little bit resistant at first because I thought, what are they talking about? This is a very Chicano movie, and uh, hello. but. Uh, my agents kept pushing and I finally went in and I read for it and I met Taylor, I read with Taylor and uh, Miklo and I, yes, and I immediately fell in love with them, I thought oh my god what nice people and then the next thing I knew I got cast and I, I really thought that was a mistake and I felt a little bit out of place because I thought I, yeah, I felt like the phony in the room but the embrace and the inclusion that I experienced from this wonderful group of people and later from you, a community as the audience, has really changed my life. And I am so, so grateful for that. And the second thing I want to say that I was a life lesson that I learned from this movie was from Mr. Hackford sitting over here because we, it, was, and it was a lesson in leadership because we spent so much time preparing for the movie and prepping and being lectured and we went on field trips to San Quentin and we were lectured by the corrections officers about what to expect and we thought we were all ready and all that sort of thing and then we got to the first day of shooting and I can tell you the first scene we shot was in the dining room you know with all of those convicts as extras and everything that as Kiki said as soon as you say quiet on the set they just go Rah! and they get even louder and it was absolute utter chaos and I remember that after all of the preparation and all of the everything that we were ready for that moment when you're trying to get the first scene in the can and it was chaos and it was so noisy and everybody was rehearsed and in place but paralyzed and I remember a second of looking around at the crew, at Gabriel with his camera people and everything, and everybody had that deer in the headlights look like, what have we gotten ourselves into? And there was that moment of, is this ever going to work? And then Mr. Taylor Hackford stepped up like it was another day at the office and said, okay, everybody, let's roll it, let's go, let's do it, and action. <laughs> 
and everybody sort of started going through the thing, and it was the first take, and it was terrible, but it broke the inertia. And I said, that is leadership. Yeah. And, oh my God, meno meno, and I've always tried to remember that when it's my turn to lead. Yes, uh, so this is my second film that I worked with Taylor Hacker. I was fortunate enough to work in La Bamba uh, with Taylor, which also was an intense movie set. Uh, uh, the thing that I took away from this, uh, we, we didn't mention Danny Trejo. Danny Trejo is a uh, one of our Vato Locos. I think he's at either his taco shop or his coffee shop up on Highland. But, um, as Taylor gave us the freedom, uh, along with Freddie, I got to design my tattoo, and I thank Freddie for allowing me to do that. I got to bring some of my personal stuff to my prison cell, which also you know, made it more personal, made it more realistic. Uh, I got to honor my grandmother who had passed away a few years before that. Um, there was a moment, I don't know if Taylor knows about this, but that uh, there were two cast members, Danny Trejo being one of them, that had spent time in the Pinta. And in hindsight, there's a lot that you can uh, understand. But what I didn't understand at the time was going back to a place where we had the freedom of going in and out, whereas the prisoners do not. And for those two actors, uh, and Jimmy ba ba Baca was very honest in saying he felt very strange being back in the joint. And he was dealing with it uh, verbally and, and at least sharing that with us. Danny, not, and one of the actors, uh, not so much. And uh, I, I called the group, the, the Onda Together, and saying, hey, uh, Taylor is allowing us to uh, improv a lot, but if you watch La Onda, the real guys in prison, they don't say a lot. A lot of it's looks, whatnot. And um, you know, my life got threatened by, by another actor. And it really put in perspective what we were actually doing there. And I think it brought a sense of realism and understanding of what actually goes on in there. And if we did our job correctly, you, that's why I think this film resonates so well. So again, I thank Taylor. I thank Kiki Kiki, Valente and I were part of the same theater company. And having our theater background really gave us a foundation and a working uh, uh, platform to start from. So my hat's off to, again, everybody who participated. And now that you mentioned Danny Trejo, he couldn't be here because he's working, but he sent us a message. So let's hear. This is Danny Trejo. I'm in St. Paul, Minnesota. I want to uh, give a shout out to all the people that are there. Sorry I couldn't make it, but uh, hey, I'm tougher than all them guys anyway. And la onda don't shine shoes. Remember that. God bless you guys. Good seeing you. Carmen, what's up, man? <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, we're going to hear from two more people and then we're going to start the movie. We're going to hear from the terrible guard that we all hated. But look at how, what a nice guy he is. It's Mike Genovese. Mike, go, go ahead. along with what Jeff was saying, there was a point where the prisoners that we were using as background decided they weren't being treated fairly. And they said, F you, we're staying in our cells today, we're not working with you. If you want to give us some coffee, some cards, some DVDs to watch, maybe a little chicken soup, a couple of sandwiches, treating us like those actors, then maybe we'll cooperate with you. And I have to assume it was Taylor who said, that's a good decision. And they went, thank you very much, and they became very cooperative. Unions. Unions is what makes America great. <laughs> thank you, Mike. Okay, now we want to hear from, we want to remember that Lupe Ontiveros had a part. Remember Lupe Ontiveros in this movie? Yes. Lupe, you're up there watching us. And also, um, there was uh, the mother, and also 
of the mother of Miklo, the mother of Crucito, but the mother of Miklo. And we want to hear from the lone woman here because family is at the heart of this movie and family starts with the mother. So let's hear from Jenny Gago. such heaven to be here with all of you on stage and here with you to be able to as an actress to be able to use our talent as actors in projects that have messages that um, reveal and free us of so many with so many insights and so many heartfelt lessons and truth is, is truly a gift and I am forever grateful, Taylor, for the project. And, and when I read the script, I said, oh my God, I have to be in this. I have to, I have to. <laughs> and, um, and to see that it has lasted this long uh, and that it's touched so many hearts. And the most important thing for me is to see how empowering this project truly is because it frees us, it opens us, and it empowers us to go ahead and be true to our blood. So blood in, blood in. <laughs> blood in, blood out. Okay, everyone, please stand up and let's give them all a big round of applause. Thank you for standing up too. Thank you so much and get ready to rock and roll with the movie. It'll start in just as soon as we get off the stage. <laughs>